Okay, I know uh, people have been uh, sitting here a long time. Um, while they're bringing uh, up my slide uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, I wanna just, uh, talk about some things that were discussed yesterday and uh, earlier today. Uh, first off, I wanna uh, thank uh, Michael and the people of Nimbin from inviting me here. I have been really impressed uh, by the spirit of the community, uh, the talent of the community, and the incredible welcoming atmosphere here. Uh, that said, I, I had uh, a discomforting feeling uh, earlier today. I was sitting uh, at the skate park uh, chatting with a couple of folks who happened to be aboriginals. Uh, they were smoking tobacco. That is a dangerous drug, uh, there's no doubt about that. Um, and uh, the police came over and they searched the belongings of the two people sitting next to me. Now, I can tell you that they weren't doing anything. They were watching uh, uh, their uh, child, uh, and uh, one the fellow was a friend of the family, skateboard and smoking tobacco. And one of the police officers looked at me and he looked at my uh, backpack and I guess he decided I was uh, older, I was white, and I was wearing a sport jacket. And I might sue the son of a bitch uh, if uh, he uh, searched my belongings without having any indication to do so, which is exactly uh, what he did to the two people sitting next to me. Uh, this kind of police state, in my opinion, is totally unacceptable. Uh, well, I want to continue reading some stuff that I uh, wrote here. Uh, the, um, when I was in Tamworth, I was interviewed by uh, Helen uh, Kapolis, who, uh, whose name has been mentioned, page forward, page forward. who's, uh, page forward. okay. Yep. Okay, so she's putting together this documentary, and I think it's going to be very powerful. Uh, the Haslams, uh, unfortunately, their son passed away. Uh, I think he might be alive today if uh, Australia had uh, different drug laws or if the United States had not pushed uh, the kind of uh, insanity uh, that we have. Uh, what we have in the United States, and I think it's the same thing in Australia, is a gathering of power at the federal level at the expense of the state and local level. Uh, the situation in the United States with the federal law is abysmal. And the majority of the American public knows that it's abysmal. I think we will probably have a change there. Uh, because of the favorable publicity that the Haslams generated, I think that uh, at a federal level that Australia may be able to set an example that the United States can follow. And we can talk about that uh, a little bit later. I do agree with Dr. Caldicott uh, regarding not conflating uh, the medical with the recreational. They are two quite separate issues. And I also agree with him that what happens when you have medical legalized is you end up with people sitting in front of their doctor, sitting in front of me, who five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, would have never imagined that they'd be talking to a doctor about medical marijuana. Uh, but now they have um, multiple sclerosis, they have Parkinson's disease, uh, they have cancer, they have failed back surgery, they've tried everything under the sun, they still have intractable pain. They still have their tremors. They have terrible side effects from the prescription medication. And lo and behold, there they are. Uh, they're a little bit apprehensive when they first uh, come in to uh, see me. And I try to make them feel more at ease uh, by telling them a little bit about uh, how long uh, this has been a medicine. I am uh, somewhat of a historian. 
Uh, I'm also a little bit disorganized. I had a wonderful banner uh, with the cover of my book on it, uh, Drugs Are Not Tools of the Devil, How Greed and Discrimination Led to a Dysfunctional Drug Policy and How to Fix It. So I put the books up here. Just imagine that there is a large banner there. Uh, the banner currently is hanging in Melbourne, and uh, you can run into Melbourne and see it if you want to. Um, and afterwards, I'll be doing a book signing, and my son will be assisting me back there. He just uh, got done doing very well uh, skateboarding. So I've got some more stuff written here, but I think I'm having a hard time reading it, and we'll just move on. So I've written a couple of books. Uh, I helped start something called the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. I'm a member of the Board of Americans for Safe Access, which is a lobbying group for medical marijuana patients. The Wall Street Journal actually had a favorable article about me in their health drug blog, uh, and that's a little bit about me. Uh, we talked a little bit about the history of cannabis as medicine, uh, describe something about modern medicinal cannabis, uh, probably touch uh, on uh, current policy issues, uh, talk a little bit about research. Okay, let me just skip through it. Uh, it's well known there are 23 states in the United States in which medicinal cannabis is legal. Uh, some places it seems to be more legal than others. Um, state of California was the first state to legalize medicinal cannabis, and it actually has the loosest and vaguest laws. And I actually suggest that uh, in terms of the, the conditions that can be treated, that there should be something like we have in California. Probably the California thing is a little bit too open-ended. There's a list of several um, conditions and symptoms. And then the late Dr. Todd McCaria added the line, or any other condition for which the doctor believes medicinal cannabis may be helpful. I like that. Uh, I think it's a little too broad to get it through uh, legislation. Well, this was an initiative. This is what the people wanted. But what we can do in the states is we can write a prescription for what's called an off-label indication. And when you uh, come up with a new prescription or a new medication, uh, you test it to see whether or not it, uh, first you do some safety trials and then you see whether it works at what you say it works for. Well, these things are expensive. They cost millions of dollars, so you usually only do it for one or two indications. But once the drug is approved, then uh, you can prescribe it for any off-label indication for which there has been subsequent research or for which there is substantial, credible, anecdotal evidence. And that should be in your law to allow the doctors to practice medicine, not the lawyers. If they want to practice medicine, let them go to medical school. So the book is full of history. and. I'd love to uh, go over that, but this group is extremely uh, sophisticated, and I suspect that you're familiar with uh, a good deal of it. But I do want to make you familiar with why we have drug laws that are irrational, illogical, an invasion of human rights, and as the previous speaker pointed, absolutely don't work. The knowledge of the medicinal value of cannabis uh, is said to be around uh, since 2637 BC. Uh, by oral tradition in China, that's when the first uh, uh, pharmacopoeia, called the Ping Chao Ching, was uh, written by Shan Nen, who may or may not have actually been a person. Uh, he is the um, uh, god of agriculture uh, and possibly the second emperor of China. There was a lot of uh, knowledge about the potential medical uses or the actual medical uses of cannabis, and they uh, were, include uh, analgesia, childbirth anesthetic, uh, migraines, indigestion, and insomnia. Uh, that probably sounds pretty familiar to people who have been using cannabis medicinally. Dr. William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, uh, who uh, was a British uh, uh, physician, who spent time in India, uh, came to be aware of the use of cannabis. The oldest 
A hard copy of a Materia Medica, a Pharmacopeia, is of Ayurvedic medicine and it dates to somewhere between 1100 or 1700 BC, and of course, it contains cannabis. So O'Shaughnessy did some studies on animals, he treated patients, he came back to England, and uh, he uh, started telling people about it. By 1854, this was in uh, the United States Pharmacopeia, and went from 1854 through 1941, uh, and uh, pretty much all the major drug companies, uh, Eli Lilly, Squibb, Merck, Park Davis, so on, uh, uh, manufactured it. Uh, just, they didn't, you know, the plant manufactured it, they just sold it. Uh, you've got uh, everything named after Queen Victoria. Uh, you'll be happy to know that she was a cannabis user. Uh, Sir Joshua Reynolds, the royal physician, uh, prescribed it for her, post, uh, uh, for her uh, PMS. Uh, he also wrote a very positive article in uh, The Lancet in 1894, uh, extolling the virtues of cannabis. Um, the 1898 date on Sir William Osler is incorrect. It should be 1892. I'm sure that is important to all of you. Uh, Osler is considered to be the founder of modern medicine, and he said cannabis was the best treatment for migraine headaches. At the time of the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, cannabis was the third or most common ingredient in prescriptions and uh, over-the-counter uh, medications. Um, the real people who were behind uh, criminalization of marijuana really wanted to criminalize hemp. And it was just sort of um, uh, fortuitous uh, that Harry Anslinger was a racist and this was soon used uh, uh, against uh, uh, minorities. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about a famous quote from uh, Anslinger who was a raving racist. Uh, George Schlichten, um, was the one who was really responsible for this because he was gonna make hemp more affordable and therefore more competitive to wood pulp for paper uh, and to the cotton industry for fiber, uh, plus many other things. And he'd invested a hell of a lot of money and a lot of time in this. As a matter of fact, in 1916, uh, the United States Department of Agriculture uh, issued Bulletin 404 uh, alerting uh, farmers to the fact that cannabis was going to make a comeback and recognized that hemp was the number one uh, profitable agricultural product in the world for 1,000 years, ending in about 1880. So Schlichten had the decorticator, and what it did is it cut the labor in half, and that's how it made it more uh, competitive. And in fact, the uh, Scripps of the Scripps Howard newspaper chain, which was the largest chain in the world at that time, uh, Murdoch uh, was, I think, just an infant. Uh, and uh, they were ready to go with this. But the feeling was is that uh, there was a lot of pressure put on them not to and to continue to go with wood pulp. And I mentioned Sir William Oso already. Uh, asthma cigarettes were popular in the 1920 uh, that uh, contained cannabis. Uh, this particular one uh, is the uh, 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 Grimaldi, uh, the Canadana, and I should have uh, made a copy of a picture that I have of an ad, uh, was produced in a country called Australia, uh, and it had uh, uh, cannabis uh, in it, uh, and you could legally buy it as a cigarette to treat your asthma. And since cannabis is both an anti-inflammatory and a bronchodilator, it contains the same therapeutic elements as uh, Advair or other uh, pre prescription medications. Uh, the only difference is, it, difference is that it has fewer side effects. In the 1920s, American physicians wrote, that shouldn't be notes, it should be wrote, millions, about three million uh, prescriptions a year that contain cannabis. Um, I'll tell you a little story in a minute. Another slide comes up about my father who was a, a pharmacist and he started practicing pharmacy in 1928. I've already mentioned that the major pharmaceutical companies marketed cannabis. And plant-based medications started to go out of style uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the progressives uh, wanted to protect us from ourselves. Uh, some patent medicines were not very helpful, and so they began to go out of style. And then uh, you had something called the Flexner Report, which tended to marginalize those uh, medical disciplines that were more um, 
supportive of herbal medication, uh, the naturopaths, the homeopaths, the osteopaths, and the allopaths, uh, which is what I am, an MD, we uh, were able to uh, rise above them, so to speak. Uh, and so newer, younger doctors saw herbal medicines as old-fashioned and recognized that uh, in the early 20th century there were enormous changes, possibly even greater than the changes that we have now, and no one wants to be old-fashioned, right? You don't want to be like your grandparents. Now, this was an article that appeared in uh, Collier's, which was a popular uh, magazine of the day, uh, and uh, it was a several-part series attacking uh, patent medicines. Not cannabis specifically, but since cannabis was in a lot of patent medicines, uh, that uh, created somewhat of a problem. So cannabis m moves from being something that was popular, being uh, the third or fourth most commonly used ingredient in prescriptions. The two that beat it out were opium and alcohol, by the way. Um, and I think we'll just skip along because we're going to talk about Harry Anslinger and the Marijuana Tax Act. I mean, it's just full of more total misinformation, total hatred of, uh, of minorities. And what, what Anslinger, uh, well, what Anslinger said was is that uh, marijuana, and they love to use the term marijuana because the American public didn't know what the hell they were talking about. The American public was familiar with cannabis. They was familiar with hemp. So they couldn't use that word because the American public would say, why are you doing that? Uh, and I'll tell you in a minute why they were doing it. So uh, Anslinger, one of the things that he said was is that uh, marijuana was used by uh, uh, Negroes. This was in the 30s, so that's what uh, that was the name for blacks. Negroes, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, jazz musicians, and other social undesirables. Uh, and that was his way of marginalizing. He forgot to mention uh, that millions of people were getting it prescribed by their doctor. Now, in 1937, when the Marijuana Tax Act was passed, there were 28 over-the-counter preparations available in the United States that you could get over-the-counter without uh, a, a prescription. But you know, there was a drop, a sharp drop uh, in doctors prescribing this because of the cult of modernism. The manufactured pharmaceuticals were seen as more modern. Also, physicians were upset because the cannabis was not standardized. Lilly probably bought their marijuana from 10 or 15 or 20 or God knows how many different growers. So each one was different. They didn't have tests for it. And the other thing was is they, uh, we thought, well, look, modern medicine just has one molecule and we can understand it better. Well, it turns out that multiple compounds in a plant are in many cases better for you because it has a greater range of therapeutic applic applicability and has far fewer side effects. So you had the prohibition propaganda. And I didn't realize this until I think I read this in another book that this is also racist, that the white man who is injected, injecting marijuana, I doubt whether anybody in the room has had marijuana injected into them, but I mean, that's a much more a way of, a better way of demonizing this, is a black man injecting it into a white woman. So let's throw some racism in there, uh, and let's make it a tool of the devil. Uh, Reefer Madness uh, was a, a propaganda piece that was put out in the 30s. Uh, if you smoke marijuana, I mean, you would go directly into the depths of hell and you'd likely murder two or three people in the next 10 minutes. And uh, of course, uh, you know, the, the marijuana would cause, it, it's interesting, uh, most of these drugs seem to only uh, uh, allow uh, Chinese or uh, blacks or Hispanics to have sex with innocent Protestant white women. It doesn't seem to affect Catholics, it doesn't seem to affect blacks, it's just innocent white women and they're preferably Protestant. Uh, this piece of um, propaganda was put out by Mr. Anslinger himself. Uh, a little bit more propaganda, you've all seen this. Uh, seduction of the innocent. Of course, it's always nice to protect our children by throwing them in jail. Uh, you know, that's, that's always bothered me that we're protecting our children by making this illegal so we can arrest them and throw them in jail. And it's also bothered me that if 
The illness that we're treating is drug abuse, and I have 50 years experience uh, doing drug abuse on a part-time basis, whatnot. I think I know a little bit about it. Um, that a good treatment for that is to throw people into jail. So the, the next time someone gets cancer, let's throw them in jail because it's such a good treatment and it's worked so well with drug abuse. You know, here we go, sex and drugs to the boogeyman. Uh, let's throw more sex in there. Uh, let's throw the devil in there. And here's a quote, a direct quote from Harry Anslinger. Now, I uh, had an uh, exhibit at the International uh, Cannabinoid Research Society about our organization, the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. And let's see, I'm just going to set this down here. Um, and it had a lot of quotes from Anslinger. And the president of the organization came up to me the next day and said, you take those quotes down, they're racist. I said, I know, that's why they're up there. What I was trying to show them is that the racism is one of the things that was interfering with their ability to do their research. Uh, but apparently, uh, they didn't get it, unfortunately. So, who testified against the Marijuana Tax Act? The American Medical Association. Dr. William Woodward has an impeccable resume. And uh, he said that the AMA knew of no harm for the medicinal use of cannabis. He also pointed out that the federal government had no credible evidence for uh, this law that they wanted to pass. Uh, he had checked with the Bureau of Prisons, Children's Bureau, blah, blah, blah. None of them had one shred of evidence to support Anslinger's claim. He said, all that Mr. Anslinger has is a fistful of newspaper clippings. And the fact of the matter is, is that most of those newspaper articles were written uh, by Anslinger himself. Okay, I'm going to move on through this. I'd love to talk to you about it. But it was available in pharmacies until 1942. Uh, when my father was a uh, freshman in the Minnesota School of Pharmacy in 1928, one of their assignments was to make tincture of cannabis. And he told me we had to be very careful uh, because the alcohol was illegal. And, and cannabis was very much legal. And you had Morris Fishbein, who was a longtime editor of JAMA, saying in 1942 that cannabis was the best migraine treatment. You had an editorial in the uh, semi-official military uh, med medical magazine, Military Surgeon, uh, written by the editor called The Marijuana Bugaboo, critical of the Marijuana Tax Act. Uh, it goes on and on. And I just mentioned this about my, the story about my father. And at the end of 1941, cannabis was removed from the United States Pharmacopeia, where it had been since 1854. The general speculation is, is that it wasn't taken out because of its decreased utilization. It was taken out for political reasons. So the 60s uh, changed things a little bit. Uh, we had an increase of the recreational use of cannabis. And we had a lot of hostility. Uh, from conservatives because uh, those of us who were of fighting age in the uh, 60s, and I was one of them, had no desire to go over to Vietnam and be killed for a reason that we couldn't understand. I now understand what the reason was. It's there's a lot of oil in the Spratly Islands, and that's why we're fighting in Iraq, and that, that's why Bush was elected president by the oil interest. interest. Okay, so we got a little sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Uh, this was in America, but it could just as easily have been a Nimbin. Uh, just throw in here for a little comic relief. Uh, Elvis was so concerned about the drug issue that he asked to be named a special agent, and Nixon made him a special drug agent. So, I don't know, it's too bad we can't resurrect uh, Elvis and bring him here to Nimbin and retire the drug-sniffing dogs. Okay, then we had the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. Cannabis was placed in Schedule 1, but that was supposed to be temporary. They directed the formation of a commission to study drug abuse in marijuana. Uh, it was 13 people on it. Nine were appointed by Nixon, four by the Congress, and Nixon admonished them not to recommend legalizing it. So they recommended legalizing recreational cannabis. This was in 1972. Imagine the lives that would have been saved had, uh, and the money that would have been saved and the research that would have been done had Nixon followed uh, the recommendations of that commission. So we begin to have some change towards the attitude towards cannabis. Uh, 
We had the first epilepsy study, was published in 1949. We did have the recommendation of the Nixon Marijuana Commission, but things really get going in 1974 with Robert Randall, who was a participant and patient number one in the independent new drug program. In 1982, the Institute of Medicine said, yep, yeah, we think cannabis is medicine. 1999, the Institute of Medicine said, we know it's medicine. In 1997, the House of Lords uh, in England uh, had a report by their Science and Technology Committee, which I recommend that you read. Uh, it's very good information. In 1999, as a result of the report uh, from GW, or from the House of Lords, GW Pharmaceuticals, a phytochemical company, they make chemicals out of plants, uh, started doing research on tincture of cannabis to treat a muscle spasm and neuropathic pain associated with multiple sclerosis. And that's probably why the House of Lords report was generated, was because they noted that there was a disproportionate number of people in England who had multiple sclerosis that were being arrested for possession of marijuana. So the Compassion Investigational New Drug uh, Program started in 1978. Uh, initially, it had uh, 15 members, and then it had a 15 plus a 35 member waiting list. And they told Randall here, they said, we're gonna give you this medicine. What he, the way he got into the program is he was going blind. And he was growing, he found that the marijuana stopped him from going blind. His apartment was raided in 1974, and he said, if you take this away from me, I will go blind. So they said, well, I'll tell you what, you prove that to us. So he went to Johns Hopkins University, which is a pretty prestigious American university, and they said, if he doesn't use marijuana, he'll go blind. And they said, well, we'd like a second opinion. So he went to the Jules Stein Eye Institute in Los Angeles, and they said, if Mr. Randall doesn't use marijuana, he will go blind. So they let him use marijuana, and they set up certain guidelines and parameters that if you were very, very ill, very, very ill, the federal government would mail you some marijuana, actually seven to nine pounds a year. And there were still four people left on that program because the program was ended in 1992. It ended because Randall had spoken to an AIDS group in San Francisco and said, I want to tell you about this program. And either 300 or 1,000, I've heard both those numbers, people submitted applications. And the George H.W. Bush administration was horrified. They said, if we put this number of people on this program, the American public will get the wrong idea. They'll think that this stuff is good for you. And so they ended the program. Now, in the early 1980s, we had the AIDS epidemic, and many people who were suffering from HIV and AIDS found that they got a lot of relief from the use of cannabis. Well, the government was disturbed by that. You know, my goodness, they're, they're going to find out that there's something good about this, which we've, of course, known for 5,000 years. So they encouraged the development of THC. Now, this is really, I mean, strange. Here we are allegedly concerned about people getting high people being happy, people feeling good. And you hear some prohibitionists say, we don't have any other drug like that. And I wonder if they've ever heard of Valium, if they've ever heard of Librium, if they've ever heard of antidepressants, or maybe they've heard of Cialis or Vi Viagra. These are all medications that are there to make us feel better. So at any rate, they approved the uh, 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 Marinol, which is THC. Uh, and that's been on the market since 1985. Uh, it, as I tell my patients, it doesn't work as well as marijuana, has more side effects than marijuana, and costs more money than marijuana. But there's a lot of people who feel comfortable with something that's been approved by the Food and Drug Administration. They like the idea of going into a conventional pharmacy rather than a dispensary. And so I'm one of the largest uh, prescription writers of Marinol and Dronabinol in the United States. And I mean, this is the odd thing. I mean, Marinol has one uh, cannabinoid. <clears throat> I'm wondering if somebody could take a sock and stick it in that guy out there, I'm not sure. But anyway, it has one cannabinoid, whereas cannabis has somewhere between 80 and 100 cannabinoids. Uh, it has fewer side effects than Marinol and works better than Marinol, yet 
we've had to fight tooth and nail to make cannabis legal, whereas Marinol uh, uh, development was uh, encouraged by the U.S. government. So this is uh, sort of my slide on the ending or, or suspending of the Compassionate Use Act. Um, then uh, the 35 people who'd been approved that were waiting to get on the program never did get on the program, but the 15 who were on it were grand grandmothered in. Okay, so we've had a lot of uh, modern research. Um, you can read this slide as well as I can. I'm going to move on. Uh, Ramsey and Davis uh, published this uh, uh, study that they did in 1947 and 1949, and it showed that uh, cannabis was useful in dramatically decreasing the frequency uh, of seizures in a group of institutionalized children with cerebral palsy. And they concluded that the cannabinoids herein reported deserve further trial in non-institutionalized epileptics. And sure enough, in 2014, uh, and you do the math, what is that, 57 years later, uh, we got around to following these guys' advice. In 1964, Raphael Meshulam characterized the structure of Delta 9 THC. And he is really the grand old man of medicinal cannabis. He's a wonderful, wonderful human being. Uh, Todd McAria was the preeminent pioneer in the United States. Uh, he had read the 1894 India Hemp Commission report, which is no small task. It's eight volumes and 3,300 pages long. In 1968, he worked for our National Institute of Mental Health uh, and was responsible for handing out marijuana research grants. He didn't last very long because he wanted to look at the benefits and the other bureaucrats wanted to look at the harms. He was a co-author of Proposition 215, which legalized medical marijuana in California. And he was a dear or a friend of mine since 1969. The endocannabinoid system is why cannabis works. We had our endocannabinoid system before the earth had cannabis. Uh, according to Robert Melamede, who recently retired as a professor at the University of Colorado, uh, the endocannabinoid system goes back to the trilobites and somewhere between 200 million and 600 million years ago, whereas the plant has only been around for 35 million years. So the endocannabinoid system uh, is composed of a couple of receptors, the CB1 receptors, which are found largely in the brain, the CB2, which are found in the immune system and in the gut. Uh, there are at least two neurotransmitters that we're aware of, uh, anandamide and 2-AG, and there are a couple of enzymes uh, that metabolize the naturally occurring cannabinoids. Now, the cannabinoids are found uh, in large part in the midbrain, uh, one place where there are practically no uh, cannabinoid receptors are in the brainstem, and this is why nobody has ever died. Because when you die from an overdose of alcohol or of uh, tranquilizers, it is because you suppressed uh, your respiratory system by suppressing the receptors in the brainstem, and since cannabis has no receptors in the brainstem, you're not going to die. Retrograde inhibition is an important uh, concept for you to be aware of. Uh, the retrograde inhibition, let's see, ah. anyway, the, the green arrow is coming from the postsynaptic neuron and going back to the presynaptic neuron. And it's causing the release of dopamine, uh, which depolarizes the cell and makes it more difficult for the next neural impulse coming along to stimulate that neuron. Now you... The middle button is the oh. laser. Oh, okay. All right. Middle button, big middle button. Thank you. Well, okay. Where am I? I... <coughs> I have a right to ignore technology because I'm getting old. Uh, anyway, so... Um, if you slow down the speed of... Um, uh, neurotransmission, this is going to make it harder for you to have epilepsy because epilepsy is an uncontrolled excessive amount of neurotransmission. Uh, and that's the way things work. Now, the distribution of neurotransmitters is on a bell-shaped curve, the same as height, weight, or anything else. Some of us have an endocannabinoid deficiency. 
We might have attention deficit disorder. Uh, we might have a seizure disorder. Or we might have migraines. And so if we increase the amount of uh, cannabinoids, we're going to increase the amount of retrograde inhibition and we're going to slow down the speed of neurotransmission. So let's talk a little bit about the plant. It's got 483 chemicals in it, give or take a couple, and that's not a lot. Coffee has 880, a tomato has uh, 380. Uh, there's over 60 cannabinoids, over 100 terpenes. The terpenes do have uh, therapeutic value. Uh, they give it its distinctive odor, and they're found extensively in citrus fruit. As an example, uh, recreationally, uh, many of you have heard of Ed Rosenthal, and he said, you know, if you have some low-grade cannabis and you want to have a better high, eat a mango about an hour uh, before you smoke the marijuana. And the mango has terpenes in it that uh, accentuate uh, the uh, euphoria. Uh, Dr. Mishulam and other uh, people who I respect uh, in the uh, cannabis and cannabinoid field have postulated that there's something called the entourage effect. This is why we want to be very careful about extracting just THC or just CBD. Uh, we want to have the totality of all of the therapeutic constituents of the plant, all of the cannabinoids, all the terpenes, all the flavonoids that may affect things therapeutically. And as I pointed out to you, uh, cannabis is much more effective than Marinol, and Marinol is just one of the more than 60 cannabinoids in the plant. Now, Mashulam talked about this in 1999, and uh, they acting together, the cannabinoids, uh, cannabinoids, the terpenes, and the flavonoids, to cause a therapeutic benefit is the entourage effect, and that's why we need whole plant extracts, and that's why uh, I do have some um, positive feelings about Sativex. And by way of full disclosure, I own a teeny weeny bit of stock in Sativex. Uh, and uh, I mean, I do have some reservations about it. It's way too expensive. Uh, and uh, the best thing about it is that I can say, here is a extract, a whole plant extract that has been approved in 20 countries in the world. 20 countries in the world. Now, I'm not sure what happened with Sativex here. I understand it was a political thing, but it doesn't make any sense at all not to allow Sativex or, or Marinol or any of these uh, prescription drugs that are based on uh, the uh, cannabinoids. Uh, and I, the Sativex uh, is the plant. It's just one uh, tincture uh, and may not be as good as the tincture that you're making yourself. I mentioned the House of Lords. I think their report was uh, very important because it helped uh, GW get going. And the reason I reference back to GW is that they have had the money to do actual clinical trials. Uh, and the clinical trials have been favorable. Okay. And so this is uh, their bottle. They, they've uh, developed a metered sprayer, so you can't get too high. Uh, worried about that. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio of THC to CBD. I believe they originally put the CBD in there uh, to counteract the euphoria. And that wasn't necessarily uh, for philosophical reasons, it was for financial reasons, because if you're a physician and you're prescribing medication and a lot of your patients come back and tell you, I had this dysphoria, I had this unpleasant feeling, uh, pretty quick you're not gonna prescribe that medication anymore. And then, to their, uh, I think, uh, pleasant surprise, they found out that CBD had a lot of therapeutic value. Basically, it was an anti-inflammatory, and so that might be useful uh, in uh, dealing with the um, uh, neuropathic pain. Um, in the United States, we have an enormous amount of hypocrisy. Uh, Clinton smoked marijuana, his wife smoked marijuana, Al Gore, the vice president of Clinton, uh, he said he only smoked it for three years. His buddy says he smoked it for eight years. What difference does it make? Uh, George Bush, I'm not sure if he ever admitted to uh, smoking marijuana. I do have it from a good source that he went to cocaine rehab and uh, he was a well-known drunk. And you know, here are some of the therapeutic uses. Uh, I'm gonna move on to a, a slide that uh, shows these uh, a little bit easier to read. Uh, it's an anti-nauseant, uh, which we've known forever. 
It's appetite stimulant. Uh, there were studies done in the 1980s in eight uh, U.S. states that showed those two things. Painkiller, almost all of the pharmacopoeia ever written say that cannabis was a painkiller. We know from uh, all of the uh, uh, recent uh, uh, material that's come out in uh, documentaries, it's an anti-epileptic. As I mentioned, it's an anti-inflammatory. It's terrific for treating uh, osteoarthritis. It's also pretty good in treating many autoimmune diseases, uh, fibromyalgia, lupus erythematosus, uh, other things we don't understand very well, reflex sympathetic dystrophy, complex regional pain syndrome. It's a tranquilizer. Axiolytic is a fancy word for tranquilizer. It's an antispasmatic. Uh, it's very helpful in treating people with Crohn's disease and irritable bowel disease. It's an antidepressant. It's a sleep aid. The most common time to take cannabis is at bedtime, uh, even though the most uh, frequent reason for recommending it by a physician in California is analgesia. It, it does amazing things for people with PTSD. And I'll talk a little bit about uh, that. Uh, is when you have rapidly moving neurotransmission, in other words, you have an endocannabinoid deficiency, your midbrain has more control, more sway over your thinking than is optimal. And your midbrain sees the world in terms of black and white, life and death. And so you have a great tendency to act first and think later. Now this was probably very helpful when you and your mate were uh, walking down the uh, forest path and a saber-toothed tiger came along, if you ran the hell away, you were not as likely to be eaten if you stood around and thought, eh, should I fight the tiger? Should I climb a tree? Should I run? You're gone. So um, the acting first and thinking later with saber-toothed tigers was beneficial. With post-traumatic stress disorder, Having poor impulse control and poor anger management is going to get you in trouble. If you slow down the speed of neurotransmission, it gives your forebrain an opportunity to think more rationally and to say, wait a minute, uh, you don't want to call the fellow you're drinking with uh, uh, a bastard. Why don't you just say, you know, I, I don't think we agree. Let's have another drink. You're going to have an entirely different evening, I think. Um, and the uh, cannabis also helps uh, get rid of the nightmares that people with PTSD have. Uh, in terms of attention deficit disorder, my experience is that anybody who uses marijuana before the age of 15 has attention deficit disorder until proven otherwise. And almost all of the people who did start th at that age either had attention deficit disorder or post-traumatic stress disorder and they told me that their grades went from D's and F's to A's and B's. Not too bad. So this is sort of my experience. Uh, pain is uh, one of the top conditions for recommending cannabis. Sleep difficulties, uh, not just insomnia, but the sleep can be interfered by anxiety and pain. Uh, nausea, of course. Arthritis and connective tissue disorders, as I mentioned. The migraines, uh, anxiety. Uh, you know, it's good for seizures, but not everybody has seizures. So, I mean, this is another whole list of additional conditions that uh, benefit from the use of cannabis. And as you're changing the law, you need to have an open-ended list, as I said. You need to follow the lead of Dr. Micaria and allow physicians to use their judgment when there is a credible anecdotal evidence and credible new research. It's useful in treating mental health and in California because of Dr. Amicaria's foresight, we can prescribe it or recommend it for depression and anxiety and panic attacks and stress and uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, and it goes on and on. One of the other ones that we shouldn't forget is autism and Asperger's. I want to mention in regards to the bipolar and the attention deficit disorder and the panic attacks as well as Tourette's that studies were done by Dr. Daniel Piamelli at the University of California at Irvine. These were animal studies clearly showing the benefit for all of those conditions. In terms of uh, Asperger's and autism, because of my fear of the Medical Board of California, who by the way I successfully sued, but I won't bore you with that story. Um, I don't usually see teenagers or children, but occasionally the parents tell me stories that are so compelling 
that I do. And oh, about three or four weeks ago, I saw a young girl with autism. And the parents contacted me a week later and they said she had a 30% improvement. And we're not just saying that. The teachers and aides at school said the same thing. We have never seen such a dramatic improvement in our child. They were overjoyed. And we have to be able to use cannabis for the, these kinds of indications in which there is plenty of evidence and plenty of anecdotal reports. So there are certain conditions that have been popularized because the right person got them or the right news person saw them, but there's plenty of other conditions that may not have the same high profile uh, in the public mind that cannabis is useful in treating. Um, the AIDS patients, the car sits an appetite stimulant, an anti-nausea and an antidepressant. Cancer patients, this is, I think, the greatest tragedy is, yes, it's an analgesic, yes, it's an anti-nauseant, yes, it's an appetite stimulant, yes, it's an antidepressant, yes, it'll help you sleep. It also might cure your cancer. Now, as a physician, I cannot stand up here and say, cannabis cures your cancer. No, somebody might sue me. But what I can say is I can quote Dr. Donald Abrams, who is an oncologist at the University of California at San Francisco, who said, there's more than enough basic science study, more than enough anecdotal studies to warrant us doing double blind studies. Let's get that going for cancer. I talked about attention deficit disorder. It's very effective. Uh, the retrograde inhibition, uh, inhibition slows down the speed of neurotransmission. It has far fewer uh, side effects than stimulants. And some people use it in conjunction with stimulants because the stimulant side effects are it interferes with your sleep, decreases your appetite, and causes jitteriness. Cannabis, on the other hand, helps you sleep, increases your appetite, and relieves your jitteriness. The PTSD it decreases the anxiety, helps control anger, decreases nightmares, um, and uh, PTSD may be caused by an increase in dopamine transporter, which dies, ties up your dopamine, and by having a, a lower amount of free dopamine, you have less retrograde inhibition, and uh, you know you have poor impulse control. So. We've got all of these studies that I mentioned, uh, uh, a couple of them previously. There were 20,000 research studies on cannabis and cannabinoids in the last 20 years. In California, uh, the late John Vasconcellos, who was a longtime assemblyman and state senator, senator uh, in 1999 got a law passed that allocated $9 million for uh, research on the medicinal benefit of smoked cannabis. And they set up the California Cannabis Research Study at the University of California at San Diego. In 2011, they released a report on 18 uh, smoked cannabis studies that were done on four medical schools in California. And you might want to check their report. In terms of safety, every major um, governmental report has recommended legalizing it. Great Britain, United States, Canada, here in Australia. Panama Canal Zone, they tried two or three times. Each time, they said, keep it legal. Then I mentioned that uh, we had Marinol, the Delta 9 THC, was approved by our Food and Drug Administration. In 1988, after a two-year rescheduling hearing, the, uh, that should read the DEA's Chief Administrative Law Judge, Francis Young, in his finding of fact, said that cannabis was one of the safest therapeutic agents known to man. Uh, of course, Health Canada has approved uh, cannabis, and the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. approved phase three uh, trials for Sativex in 2006. Uh, they still haven't put it into uh, the approved uh, status. In 2010, the European Union did approve Sativex, which, as I mentioned earlier, is a whole plant alcohol extract from two strains of cannabis, one high in THC, the other high in CBD. Um, People raise a lot of questions about the long-term effect, effect on children. Uh, I think it's a very bad effect on children to throw them in jail. I think it's a bad effect on children uh, to uh, search their um, belongings uh, because you think they might have a plant. Uh, Dr. Melanie Dreyer, who's the dean of the School of Nursing at Rush Medical School, did a study in Jamaica in 1968. And this study documented that children of women who smoked cannabis during pregnancy 
did better in school and reached their developmental landmarks sooner than children of women who did not smoke cannabis during pregnancy. Now, when she adjusted for education, and both of these groups are lower educated, but the women who smoked marijuana had a little bit higher education and she found there was no difference. So that's my take home. There's no difference. Or maybe a little bit of benefit. Uh, Dr. Donald Tashkin's story is interested. He had received a numerous, numerous grants from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And his preconceived notion, he's a very honest uh, researcher. And as Dr. Caldecott well knows and pointed out, uh, most researchers uh, have sold their soul to the pharmaceutical companies or they are religious zealots uh, and they're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in doing legitimate research. They're on a crusade. Tashkin's crusade was to find the truth. Now, he believed that cannabis caused lung cancer and he had good reason to believe that because smoked marijuana does have more carcinogens than tobacco, except, of course, for nicotine. Uh, and what Tashkin did is he compared 1,100 patients uh, who had um, cancer of the head and neck with 1,100 patients, 1,100 people, control group, of similar age, sex, and geographic neighborhood. And what he found was is that the more marijuana you smoke, the less likely you were to get lung cancer. Nobody was more surprised than he. And this is because, of course, the anti-cancer effect of marijuana. He said, what he said is, yes, marijuana is a carcinogen, and no, it does not cause cancer. And the reason he said it was a carcinogen is because it irritates the bronchial tree but it doesn't increase your risk of cancer. Now, to show you how devious the politicians are, there was a study done just down the road here in New Zealand using the same methodology, except it only had 15% of the people, they had 300. And the last box of heavy users had too small a number to be statistically significant. But if you looked in that box, you could say if you smoke more, gee, it looks like it might cause more cancer. Except all of the rest of the boxes said no, the more you smoke it goes down. And if you were a real researcher, you would throw that box out. It wasn't statistically meaningful. And Tashkin has been an enthusiast in regards to debunking the government's hypocrisy because the government tried to bury his results. And he's a man of integrity. I commend you to, re to see a documentary called "What If Can uh, called Medicinal Cannabis and Its Impact on Your Health," and that has Dr. Tashkin, Dr. Abrams, myself, some great archival footage, medicinal cannabis and its impact on your health. In 2009, uh, the AMA, the American Medical Association, recommended rescheduling cannabis to Schedule II, and in so doing, they joined over 100 other healthcare organizations in support of medicinal cannabis. Those medical organizations included the American College of Physicians, the American Nurses Association, and the American Public Health Association. Uh, but that doesn't stop our federal government from uh, being uh, hypocrites and doing absurd things. Uh, the DEA uh, would not allow cannabis to be studied uh, by uh, Dr. Lyle Craker, who is an expert in botanical medicines at the University of Massachusetts. That's a long story and I won't go into it. We did have a nice article on the use of cannabis for pain written by Dr. Abrams. The FDA did approve the phase three clinical trial for Sativex, meaning that they thought it was safe. We've had a lot of ambivalence on the part of uh, Obama and Holder, talking about uh, respecting research and then not respecting it, talking about respecting states' rights and not doing that. On the other hand, they have allowed the experimentation in uh, Colorado and Washington to uh, go forward. Um, Schedule one status means that uh, cannabis has no known medical use in the United States. Now, I guess the way you do that is you go, nah, 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 and I'm not listening to the 23 states that have legalized it, uh, the thousands of physicians that have made recommendations or the millions of patients that are using it. Uh, this is a, a legal gobbledygook in the United States, and I think I'll just skip that. 
Uh, Obama did say this, and then he hasn't done a hell of a lot about it. Oh, I should share with you, this is not uh, breaching any patient confidentiality. Uh, one of my patients was a, was a classmate of uh, Barry Obama, which is what he was called when he went to Occidental, and said he was one of the number one dopers on uh, campus. And uh, one of my other patients grew up on Oahu and said that Barry and his cousin were uh, some of the biggest dope sellers in high school. Uh, so I keep waiting for Obama. And Obama was honest in his autobiography and said, yes, I smoke dope. Um, I think that the best way to approach cannabis medicinally is to do it medically, to approach it the same as you would if you were prescribing anything. Now, I understand that it's safe. I understand that, that many people like it recreationally, but if you have a law that says it's medical, then you're undermining the credibility of the medical utility of the cannabis if you don't treat it medically. Um, so, the procedures for giving approval and recommendation in California were extremely vague. Uh, that was both good and bad. I mean, you ended up with some physicians, I spent an hour with my patients, and I do a lot of expert witness work, and I had a case in the county next to ours. The assistant D asked me, well, doctor, how long do you spend with the patient? Hoping I'd say five minutes, and I said an hour. And that was about the end of the cross-examination. He, he put his tail between his legs and, and sat down because he knew that I was practicing real medicine and everything that I would say after asking that question was going to help the person they were trying to persecute or prosecute. Uh, so we, the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine, um, set up our own standards, which are not too different than the Medical Board of California standards, a bona fide doctor-patient relationship, you know, if some doctor pulls up in a trailer with the, his alleged examining room there and the line forms in front and you can see the line move, he's probably not spending very much time with the patients. So you need to have a bona fide doctor-patient relationship, a good faith history and physical. You ought to review the records. You should, uh, well, they want to plan with objectives. Now, I was the medical director of the oldest Medicaid managed care program in the United States and uh, we, this was an expensive program. Uh, we got over $100 million a year from the state of California, and so we had an annual medical audit. And I can tell you that the auditors never looked for a plan with objectives. And the person needs to have a condition which will benefit from the use of cannabis. I like that wording. My criteria, <clears throat> because I'm trying to keep medical marijuana credible, is to screen out the sophomores from UCSB who call up and say, I can't eat and I can't sleep. And you say, ah, were, were you ever treated for this? Or when was the last time you were treated? And they say, uh, no, uh, I don't believe in doctors. And then we say, well, you'll have to see one of the other doctors that makes recommendations because you can come and see Dr. Bierman. You can spend an hour with him. I, spent, I charge $250 an hour. Now, my competitors who spend 10 minutes with the patient charge $160. So. I charge more, but I also charge less if you're looking at it, you know, by the time that you spend with the person and what you get uh, from the doctor. So the first appointment uh, should be 35 to 60 minutes. In my case, it's 60. I do a history and physical, uh, and I discuss uh, the uh, uh, state uh, card, which is uh, voluntary. I discuss the science try to keep good records, uh, and I follow the person as medically appropriate and refer and treat as needed. And I, am I getting uh, And I talk about the different routes of administration because not everybody likes to smoke. A lot of people like to vaporize. Uh, tinctures, of course, are becoming more popular. And uh, as marijuana medicine has become more mainstream in the U.S., there are companies not uh, your mainstream pharmaceutical companies, but alternative pharmaceutical companies that are making tablets with known dosages of uh, THC and CBD. So we have the California Center for Medical Research. I mentioned them. Uh, the, there was a great effort put to block research on post-traumatic stress disorder. You, you, 
run five minutes and then we'll go to questions? Okay. And uh, let me just go, go through that. Dr. Sicily finally got that approved after both the federal government and then after they approved it, the state of Arizona tried to block it. Uh, she's have, doing it in Colorado and it's being funded by private donors, as Dr. Caldecott mentioned. Epidiolex is a high CBD strain that the GW has made. About two weeks ago, they issued a report uh, that in one of their clinical trials, it reduced seizures by 50%. The stock went up 13%. I own stock. I was delighted. Uh, Dr. McAllister has been approved to do a study uh, on breast cancer. He uh, showed that uh, THC would cure breast cancer in mice. So if your mouse gets breast cancer, I give him a little marijuana. Okay. I will mention the 20,000 studies. Uh, classification of marijuana as a Schedule I drug, as well as the continuing controversy as to whether or not cannabis of medicinal value are obstacle to medical progress in this area. Based on evidence currently available, the Schedule I classification, that is that marijuana has no known medical use and has a high uh, propensity for abuse, is not tenable. It is not accurate that cannabis has no medical value or that information on safety is lacking. Nothing could be clearer than that. Ten years of research at respected medical institutions in the state of California. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Obama actually smoking marijuana. Okay? So, let's see. So we need product standard standardization. We need professionalism in growing, dispensing, and prescribing. All products should be labeled. They should have the dosages. They should have plant constituents. There should be standards for physicians. We need to marginalize those doctors that are practicing minimalist medicine. The dispensaries need to be professional. They need to be regulated. They should be like pharmacies. You can use a health spa model. We need to do research on conditions like cancer and post-traumatic stress disorder. We need to look at the, closer at the role that terpenes play. And so this is just a reiteration. And education, we must educate the medical students. And we need to educate the general public. Uh, I don't think that the politicians can be educated. But the, vote, the ballot box can get their attention. Uh, okay, and uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, um, Rodney Dangerfield was a patient of mine, and thank you very much. <laughs>